That's, cool. that's worth the whole trip cool. just to see that one. Yeah, you got to wonder what brings grown men out into the desert on a weekend just to huddle around a rock. Easy guys, easy guys. It's going to be tough getting in though, I can tell that already. Oh, look at that. <laughs> okay, this is cool. Okay, okay. Time to let everybody see what's happening here. It's a young female. Yeah, a young female rattlesnake. Okay, I guess that's kind of cool as long as she's in there and we're out here. But really, what's the big deal? This is unprecedented for um, uh, studies of rattlesnakes. It's actually oh, getting images of them in oh, their dens. He's like checking this out. This takes really good technology oh, wow. to get back there. So we're very, very pleased camera. to get these kinds of images. These researchers are using a small, high-tech, half-inch square color video camera with a separate light source. The light source is a pair of LEDs that uh, we kind of uh, fabricated ourselves. We put some LEDs onto a uh, little printed circuit board so it's really small and we could pass it in independently of the camera to provide lighting for the camera. Yeah, the light's a little to the size. The camera, LEDs, and recorder are powered by small 12-volt batteries so that everything is portable for use in the field. Nothing like a little seat-of-the-pants creativity to get the job done. We uh, have them, both the camera and the LEDs, uh, taped to a very high-tech coat hanger to <laughs> poke back into this crevice. Uh, the Rube yeah, Goldberg. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we used official gaffer's tape. Come on. Well, official or not, just make sure she doesn't decide to come out. So, Bruce, what do you see in there? I see an adult diamondback looking straight at me. You can actually see the heat-sensing... Oh, oh, a tongue, tongue flick. <laughs> Look at that. Yoo-hoo! Oh, look at that. Isn't that sharp? You can see the eye. Right there. You can see the eye now. Oh, jeez. You can look see at the that. pore. That pore is huge using this camera. Oh and then you've got the God. right eye looking at you. And you got those sure. kind of bony coverings on the eye to protect it. You can see his eye, his left and his right eye, kind of up on top of the head, but those two holes right in front of the right and left hand side of the face are the heat sensing sensors. Well, those holes are called L'Oreal pits and are used to detect heat put <laughs> off by their prey. All right. As well as potential predators. Now, this is nice. This is That's extremely this nice. Is wonderful. All right, guys. We're in the upper Sonoran Desert, just north of Tucson, not too far east of Picacho Peak. Led by biologist Gordon Shewitt, they're studying the spatial ecology of western diamondbacks what they eat, and how they spend their time throughout the year. We're also collecting data on genetics. One of the fascinating things about denning is that it does not appear to be uh, used to avoid inclement weather or cold weather in this particular case. So the reason for denning needs to be explained in the Sonoran Desert, say different from that of rattlesnake populations in more uh, cold climates, where clearly getting to a den is important for survival. Here it's not essential. <laughs> They're only five years into the study and already some interesting observations have been made, including how the sexes utilize dens differently, including the observation that females often prefer small rodent and mammal dens over rock crevices. In the males, however, they tend to be more gregarious and in the case of the den behind us here, we know of at least seven to eight males that consistently use this den or show high fidelity to it. Thus, we are interested in the possibility that there might be a social structure undiscovered at this point that reflects perhaps close kinship, brothers, other family types of units. So with the types of technologies we have today to be able to look at uh, DNA and analyze it, we can determine some degree of pedigree or kinship with these particular animals. Maybe we have a family here behind us in the den. We're studying adult animals primarily, and so we're looking at animals that have already have established their spatial ecology or home range. And what we see if we track the animals from some period in spring and then look at their later spring and summer and then returning back to the den in November, well, it's a beautiful morning out in the desert. That tracking entails the use of more high-tech equipment, radio transmitters and receivers. 
Rattlesnakes are famous for their ability to blend into their surroundings. So if you went out and solely relied on your eyes, well, you'd walk right past most of them. We have marked and microchipped over 100 snakes in a square kilometer area. So we have a pretty decent population of rattlesnakes here. Uh, I caught my first snake. It was a garter snake in my mar mother's garden at four years old. I've been fascinated with them ever since that. We currently have 20 snakes that have transmitters placed inside of them. Uh, it, you have to put these transmitters inside of the snake because if they are external, the first time the snake would shed his skin, out would come the transmitter. The transmitters beep faster when the animal is warmer and slower for when the animal is colder. We can still hear the signal. So researchers can tell the body temperature of the snake even as they approach. Now that's good info to know since a warmer snake tends to be more active than a cooler snake. This equipment has a range of about a kilometer, so we are able to just kind of stand here and pick up some various signals of various animals that are, that are all around us now and use this equipment to track it right down to the nearest square foot of ground that they may be under or maybe on top of as well. And what we're going to do is dial in the signal of a diamondback that is a female diamondback. She is number 30. We have named her Beatrice because she lived in a bee cave at one point, which was terrifying for us. So I have her signal dialed in. We're just going to go ahead and turn it on, see if we hear anything. She sounds like she's about 50 meters to the north of us here. Once the den is located, yet another piece of extremely high-tech equipment comes into play. Well, yeah, okay, it's a mirror. The mirror is used to reflect sunlight into the den in an attempt to see the snake. No such luck with this gal. And she's probably about three feet under the surface of the ground right now, just uh, chilling out. When we look at that home range, males cover a much larger area in general. So. In general, males have the volume or the size of their home range is much larger. So it can be uh, in the, in the uh, magnitude of several hundred hectares. Uh, females vary. They can have home ranges that approximate that of males, or they can have very tiny home ranges, maybe of just a few hundred square meters. All living things require food, water, shelter, and space in appropriate arrangement. Since the snake's shelter and space are dictated by their geographic location, researchers are concentrating their studies on how individuals are being shaped by the landscape, specifically the availability of water and food. There is no water here in the Sonoran Desert at our location, so most of their water is coming through what they feed on, and that would be primarily rodents. Now a lot of people think they're safe from snake strikes in the winter because the snakes are in hibernation. As is the case with most myths, that simply isn't true. We see activity year round here. So we study diamondbacks 24-7 uh, basically and uh, consider winter to be a very active time. So for example, uh, it is not unusual for animals to make small movements during the winter outside of their dens perhaps even visiting other individuals, nearby locations. And we have a couple of examples uh, this year already of males visiting girls. And that might be that they're keeping track of their uh, potential mates for upcoming spring. March and early April are their mating periods. Now, as unbelievable as it may seem, Gordon and his crew have seen pack rats and rattlesnakes sharing the same den. That's rather like living with your mortal enemy. In addition to studying rattlesnakes, one can't help but to study the other fauna. And we've been very interested in the relationship that the adult diamondback has with its prey, at least most of the time of the year, and that would be the pack rat or neotoma. Neotoma are very abundant in this region and build their nests above the ground here for the most part. They're called middens. The rattlesnakes during the active season, April through October, are feeding, going to these middens and feeding on the occupants of that midden. But during hibernation, when the snakes are at the den, the pack rats often occupy the den, and these are perhaps male pack rats, and will not be harmed by the snakes. The snakes are perfectly active, moving about. In fact, we've seen the pack rats moving about on the snakes. 
In addition to occupying the den, the pack rats will actually bring pieces of choya, cactus, in their mouth and stuff the entrance of the den with this material, which seems to deter other potential predators to the pack rat, but also may aid the rattlesnake. So this is something that we're looking at as a potential symbiosis between this particular rodent and the diamondbacks, and that would make for a good study in the future.